Good morning and welcome to our second Lord Mayor's Knowledge Miles lecture on the psychology behind getting what you want. A very enticing topic. Our speaker today is a psychiatrist working in Harley Street who unsurprisingly sees a lot of human unhappiness and frustration. One common theme, which I'm sure many of us can relate to, is the unhappiness derived from life not delivering what we wanted or not looking how we imagined. Fortunately for us, today Dr. Prasad will be sharing a key secret he has learned that underlies this deep human predicament. In order to get what we want from the world, we need to give something to the world first. And if we have delivered the right thing, then the world will give us back what we want. The only thing is we need to work out each time what it is the world is demanding from us, because it's not obvious. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raj Prasad, a consultant psychiatrist who has worked as a consultant at the Bethlehem Royal and Maudsley NHS hospitals in London from 94 to 2008, and is an honorary senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, University of London. He was also research fellow at John Hopkins University in the USA and Institute of Neurology at Queen's Square. Unusually for, for a psychiatrist, he also holds a degree in psychology obtained with first class honours and eight other degrees and diplomas, including a master in statistics. In 2004, he was appointed visiting professor for public understanding of psychiatry at Gresham College and was asked to edit its first book, which was published in 2007 and reached the top 10 bestseller list. All of his five previous books have also been top 10 bestsellers. We'll share the um, names of the books in the um, chat box for this talk so you can have a look at them. And the Times newspaper also um, placed him as one of the top 20 mental health gurus in the world. And he also has a free app on iTunes and Google Play entitled Raj Prasad in Conversation, which includes a lot of free information on the latest research findings in mental health and interviews with top experts from around the world. So you can look, look, look up those up afterwards in the chat box. And I'm Charlotte Dorb Ashley and I'm the manager of the Financial Services Club at ZN in the heart of the City of London. We'll record this session and it'll be available to watch on our website within 48 hours and we'll also hold a 20 minute Q&A session after Raj's presentation. So please use the chat box to enter your questions now so we can feed them into the conversation early. Um, now before I hand over to Dr. Prasad for the um, goods that we're waiting for, we've got a few poll questions for the audience. So first of all, in terms of generally getting what I want, one, Others are getting more of what they want compared to myself. Two, getting what you want comes naturally and cannot be learned. Three, most people already know what they want, generally speaking. And four, once you grasp what you truly want, this cannot change. So I'll just leave that up there for a moment for people to select um, which one resonates the most with them. And then we'll have a look at what we say. Um, quite intrigued to see what people think with this. Um, this question. Just leave it up for a moment longer. So if you haven't already, please um, select your preference there. Okay, now um, we'll just bring up the results. Okay, so definitely um, most people think that, or well, many people think that others are getting more of what they want at 44%. Um, and 20% already know what they want. 24% um, believe that once you grasp what you what you truly want, this cannot change. And 12% think it comes only 12% think it comes naturally. So I think we're all in need for learning what your tips are here, <laughs> Dr. Prasad. Yes. Yeah, so it's very interesting that poll. The, the very high number of people who believe other people are getting uh, what they want and we're not getting what we want is very interesting. Um, so I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, a psychiatrist, many people will know, is a doctor. I often like to tease my clients by asking them what's the essential difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Often a lot of confusion around this uh, in the area. Um, there's lots of different terms, psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, counselor, therapist. What do all these words mean? So I ask people what's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and some of them will say, well, a psychiatrist is medically qualified and can prescribe drugs. And that is true. I did go to medical school um, and I can prescribe. But the essential difference, the key difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist is 150 pounds an hour. It's an old joke, but one of my favorites. So I also did a degree in psychology um, halfway through medical school. So I kind of like add to the confusion by being a kind of a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Um, so as a psychiatrist, I work in Harley Street. I'm actually I'm speaking to you from um, not Harley Street, but Aruba, a small Dutch, uh, former Dutch colony 
off the coast of Venezuela. Aruba is a small island in the Caribbean. I'm playing in the World Championship of Beach Tennis, and I may explain uh, why that is relevant to this conversation um, uh, if we get enough time later. I thought I'd just casually drop that into the conversation that I'm playing in the World Championship in Beach Tennis. I was ranked, I play a lot of tennis, and that will come up later. Um, I took up this new sport, beach tennis. I play that as well. I was ranked four or three years ago in the UK uh, when they published the first rankings uh, at number 16. I was very proud of this. Number 16 ranked UK men's in beach tennis. I, I very proudly said to my wife, I, the rankings have just been published in beach tennis and I'm ranked number 16 in the UK. She seemed surprisingly unimpressed with this number because her response was, wait a minute, wait a minute, Raj, um, you're ranked number 16. How many men actually play beach tennis in the UK? Is it 14? Which I thought was a rather brutal uh, response. Um, so we may come back to that point because that is relevant to the conversation about what do we want? So many people think that as a psychiatrist, what happens is that people come to me with a wide variety of different diagnoses, and that's true, depression, anxiety, I do a lot of marital therapy. Um, and so um, people borrow the medical model when they think about um, human unhappiness. Um, you could collapse it all down to say everything that basically people come to me, whether it's obsessive compulsive disorder or anorexia or, or ADHD or any of the long list of psychiatric diagnoses, you could just basically cut to the chase and say that people are unhappy. And one of the deep questions I observe in my practice as to why people become unhappy, and even if they don't get so unhappy as to come and see a psychiatrist, there's a lot of unhappiness out there in the world, a lot of people not feeling as happy or as content with their lives um, as they might otherwise do, as we could see from the poll. Um, and so there's a lot of unhappiness and the deep question, maybe the essential question of the human predicament is why is that? Why are people unhappy? Well, what we observe is people seem to find themselves in a predicament and unhappiness ensues. Uh, you're married and your wife or husband leaves you and now you're alone and this produces unhappiness. Um, you're in a job and then suddenly you get the sack or financial circumstances change in your industry and you lose your job and you're now unemployed and that produces unhappiness. The reason why all these predicaments produce unhappiness and stress is basically they're not what you want. You want a job and now you don't have a job. You want to be in a relationship and now you're not in a relationship. So um, at the deep question of the causes of human unhappiness, and I'm sure we're gonna, it's a controversial point, we're gonna have a back and forth about this in the Q&A afterwards, is basically we arrive uh, in, a, in a predicament and discover the world is not delivering or giving us what we want. And the Zen Buddhists um, understood this problem many centuries ago, and they came up with a very um, radical and profound solution, which is stop wanting things. If the fact that you want a husband and a wife and now they've left you makes you unhappy, the actual reason for your unhappiness, according, according to Zen Buddhism, is the fact you desired a wife or a husband in the first place. They see the root of all unhappiness is in wanting stuff, is in desire. So their philosophy is to get rid of desire, stop desiring stuff, lead a simple life, and if we remove desire, we then remove unhappiness. Now, there may be some Zen Buddhists out there watching this who will argue with me that, that I've, I've, I've done a, uh, a tragic um, oversimplification of Zen Buddhism, but and I'm happy to have a back and forth, but I honestly believe that is one essence of what they're trying to say. So the problem with that, though, of trying to do away with one, so there is actually a sense in which you should think hard about that because there is a deep human truth in that. The problem, though, is if you get rid of all wants, you run into trouble because at one very basic level, as human beings, we are almost biologically programmed to want certain things like food, um, physical intimacy, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth, shelter. Um, but definitely we are, we tend to want relationships. We want to be with other people, friendships, children, families, husbands and wives, parents, we want these things. And the problem is the inevitable end point of Zen Buddhism is you become a monk in a monastery. 
okay? You leave society and you end up living alone or with a fellow, a bunch of fellow Zen Buddhist monks in society. So the problem is, if you go down the route of not eliminating wants or eliminating desires, and certainly the climate change activists actually coincide with the Zen Buddhists, they say we need to stop wanting stuff in order to save the planet. So there's a deep sense in which this is actually a profound question that's come back to haunt us and to, we have to consider. So that's another aspect of, of this talk, um, that in order to save the planet, you've got to stop wanting stuff in quite the way that you do at the moment. But the problem, as I said, with Zen Buddhism and the, 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 the Buddhist philosophy of getting rid of wants is you end up an isolated individual. Um, and people actually fundamentally find that very difficult to cope with. And so I have to also say that society breaks down. If everyone moves into a Zen Buddhist monastery, then you can do away with MRI scanners and, and traffic police and, and surgeons and, and all that stuff. OK, so there is a problem in my view with the Zen Buddhist view that the, the way to deal with the central problem of human unhappiness is get rid of desire, get rid of wants, um, because if we get rid of wants, then society collapses. So I want to suggest um, there's another way of thinking about this problem. And what are the key essentials in the problem of what we want leading to human unhappiness is a the way we think about how to decide what we want is problematic. And we base how we decide on what we want on desire and human emotion. And we are in an individualistic, individualistic Western world um, captured by the idea, because people are always asking us, what do you want? At an interview, they'll say, where do you see yourself in five years' time? This kind of stuff. Um, one of the most dangerous questions I see parents and teachers asking young people is, what do you want to be when you grow up? This is a deeply problematic question, in my view, because of the way it goes about and sets out thinking, how to think about what do we want? Because it it localizes the issue in individual human preference. It sees the world like a box of chocolates. Which chocolate do you want? Um, and that is very dangerous. And I think deeply rooted in that question and that way of thinking about what do you want and asking people that question, you are setting them up for deep human unhappiness ultimately. That may seem a very surprising statement, but I'll explain why I'm saying that in a moment. The second problem there are two basic problems. If first one is deciding how to make a coherent decision, a sensible decision, a functional decision that will work about deciding what you want. The second one is how to go about getting it. Having decided what you want, um, how to go about achieving that. And a lot of human unhappiness arises from the fact that people do have a clear idea of what they want, but they go about getting it in what I can best describe provocatively in a cat-handed manner, which is not going to deliver what they want. Um, so um, the, we're going to show, I want the slide of the Spice Girls to come up now. Um, the Spice Girls are a famous uh, pop group. I did meet them once in the green room of a television studio, actually, when I was doing a television phone in. I, uh, in the, they were massive in the 90s, many years ago. Many of you may not remember this band. Um, I met them in the Green River TV studio. Being a geeky academic, I had no idea who they were. I was finding it difficult um, to breathe and think at the same time as talking to them. These are glamorous, young, very attractive women. Um, and I had no idea they were a famous pop band because I spent all my time in libraries. Uh, and I asked them what they did. I asked them if they were models. So I put my foot right in it there. And they understood um, straight away who they were dealing with. They were very sharp people, actually. I mean, I don't mean to sound patronizing, but anyway, um, they said, um, we're a popular music combo, my lad, which was a famous quote, by the way, from the 1960s, when the Rolling Stones um, lead singer Mick Jagger, I think, was up for some yet another drugs offense charge or something in the 1960s. And the judge, who was clearly, you know, a little bit behind the times, had no idea who the Rolling Stones were um, and asked, who are the Rolling Stones? What is this? And uh, the barrister in the courtroom said, they're a popular music combo, my lad, um, which has gone down in history as the response to someone who has no idea about popular culture. Anyway, um, so um, who knew the Spice Girls would, in one of their songs, Wanna Be, capture one of the deepest, most profound philosophical statements about how to think clearly about what you want? I'll just read the lyrics to you. Um, uh, Yo, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. 
So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I want a hay, I want a hay, I want a hay, I want a hay. I want a really, really want a zigzag R. Now, that's not the bit that has the most profound bit of philosophy in it, believe it or not. Here's the bit coming up. Um, if you want to be my lover, you've got to get with my friends. Make it last forever. Friendship never ends. If you want to be my lover, you've got to give. Taking is too easy, but that's the way it is. Let me just repeat that line. You have got to give. Hello. Okay. So the central problem with the question um, of what do we want, is it starting in the wrong place? Start in another place, which is what does the world want? If the world wants certain things, and therefore we're pushing at an open door, if we try to deliver what the world wants, if we deliver what the world wants, then it is highly likely we're in a better position to get what we want in return. Obviously, if you're in a relationship with someone and you keep delivering what they want, and they don't give anything back, the lack of reciprocity in that relationship is deeply problematic. Don't be with people like that. Um, so. Um, when you ask a young person, what um, do you want? Instead, the question should be, what is it the world wants and that you can get good at delivering so that you can earn a living from delivering what the world wants? And in return for delivering what the world wants, you will get what you want. So I want you to see something very important. We have flipped the question on its head. Never ask what you want. Ask instead what the world wants, what society around you wants, what your partner wants, what your children want. Ask instead what people around you want. And in delivering what they want, you may get in return what you want. And that's a very profound, opposite, challenging, um, contrarian way of dealing with this problem. But I think that is a much better way of dealing with this problem. Now, let me um, give a practical example of this. I went to one of the most competitive medical schools um, uh, when I went to medical school back in the early uh, 1980s, a long time ago now. And there were, the medical schools have expanded. Education has turned into a business. It's not an education system anymore. And there's now 400 people sitting in the lecture theater, which is disastrous. Um, and no one feels they're really being taught in an individual personalized educational experience anymore. But when I was privileged to go to medical school at University College London, um, there was only 130 people in the year, and the dean actually knew every one of you and noticed when you weren't turning up to lectures, by the way. He actually came knocking on the door of one of my fellow students, which was very impressive now, thinking back on it, in terms of that individualized educational experience, which people can't get anymore. Anyway, um, so here's a, here's a, I'm going to exaggerate the numbers a little bit, but the, the numbers are that, that far off. 125, 130 people at medical school. If you ask all those medical students just starting their career in medicine, what do you want to do? What do you want to specialize in? There's 130 medical students. 129 of them said, I want to be a surgeon. That's understandable. Surgery is the glamorous, perhaps high earning, sexy end of medicine. Um, and these people that maybe had watched George Clooney in ER, I think ER was around at that time, I'm not sure, or some TV series where you see some glamorous surgeon jumping up and down on someone's chest, bringing people back from the dead. So um, you ask 130 medical students, what do you want to do? 129 said surgery. One, me, I was the only one at medical school, I said psychiatry. I mean, I did want to do psychiatry, but I could see there was a deep problem with all these 129 others wanting to be surgeons. There just wasn't enough surgery to go around. There weren't enough surgical jobs to go around. So they were asking themselves the wrong question. Yes, you wanted to be a surgeon, but can the medical system support 129 surgeons coming out of medical school? No, it cannot. At best, 20 of the 130 in the year were going to make it to surgeons, and the others would fall by the wayside and have to think about wanting something else. Deep point here. We have to be able to change what we want. That's at the heart of mental health. If you are rigid and stuck with only one way of wanting something, you can't change what you want, you're going to end up in trouble inevitably, and you might as well get a season ticket now to my clinic. So 129 people want to be surgeons. None of them are thinking, wait a minute, I can't help but notice everyone else wants to be a surgeon. Maybe I need to rethink what I want because what I want 
isn't compatible with integrating me into society and the world, and there's going to be a problem. And sure enough, there was. No one wanted to be a psychiatrist, and they said that to me. They teased me. They said, Raj, why do you want to be a psychiatrist? No one wants to be a psychiatrist. And I thought to myself, that's a very good reason for choosing it, because mental health problems are common. No one seems to want to do it. I quite want to do it, and therefore I will definitely have a job. And sure enough, uh, if you follow the trajectory of these people who left medical school, there may be a few who will now take issue with me in the Q&A. Um, I became a consultant, which is the top job of the National Health Service here in the UK, alarmingly fast. Um, I think I was a consultant by about the age of 30. Um, the older surgeons weren't consultants till 40, 45 in some places, or late 30s. And at that stage, very interestingly, they were burning with envy at the fact that my career had seemed to be accelerated. And they hadn't spotted the problem. They kept saying, There's, this is really weird. How come you become a consultant already? Oh, it's not rocket science. Let's go back to the beginning with what you wanted and what I wanted. You were asking what you wanted in terms of your individual personal preference and not thinking hard about how that integrates you into society. And so we live in a society, we live in an economy, and I think economists are much better at thinking in this way than psychiatrists and psychologists. And in order to live in a community and to make that work, we have to think about how we um, collaborate over what we want with what that community wants. The community needed psychiatrists. It didn't need that many surgeons. And I chose to deliver what the community wanted. And in return, I got back something. Let's take another example. A lot of young people, you say, what do you want? And they want to be an actor because they've seen Tom Cruise on TV or in the cinema. And this is heading for big trouble. OK, so they go to acting school and then discover way too late there's tens of thousands of unemployed actors. There's too much supply of actors and not enough that society needs. Now, that may be what you want back then and maybe what you think will deliver happiness. But I can assure you of something. Once you've been a waiter, which is actually what most actors end up doing, those who choose acting, for decades and not making it and failing audition after audition, that produces deep unhappiness. So right there was a central problem with you deciding to pursue your dream, live your passion, which is terrible advice given to a lot of young people. And there is a, a meme, TikTok meme video of someone parodying that advice, which is well worth um, looking at. So I'm um, just putting up the next slide. This is a slide of Elon Musk. Elon Musk said something very interesting recently. Now, Elon Musk is one of the world's wealthiest men. That is not an accident. The reason that happened is because he kept delivering things that the world wanted um, in spades. And he also delivered it in a unique way that no one else was able to deliver. And lo and behold, the man becomes one of the wealthiest people on the planet. So it's very interesting, given he himself at some deep level, maybe unconscious, he doesn't consciously verbalize it, understands that the secret is to think about what the world wants and then deliver what the world wants and then you'll get what you want back in return. He said something very interesting recently at a famous AI conference. I'm gonna paraphrase what he said. He said, AI will mean that you will not have to work in the future. No one will have to work, he said. I'm paraphrasing, I'm not getting it exactly right, but that's roughly what he was insinuating. It grabbed all the headlines. He then said, you will only work if you want to which I thought was a very interesting statement and slightly mad because, no, you will not work if you want to. You will work if society wants you to work when it has an AI option. And if the AI option is better than you, you will not be working because society will not choose your job for you to deliver that job if AI can do it better. So it was a, frankly speaking, in my opinion, incoherent statement, but it embodied, again, the central problem of Western society, that um, it's saying, what do you want? It's asking you the question. It's a contract, um, and people are falling for it all the time, um, as if that is a possibility. Instead, ask yourself something, and Elon Musk should have said this, you will only be working after AI comes along if you are able to deliver some things that society wants from you rather than AI. If that is possible, yes, you will work, should you want to, uh, because you can deliver something that society wants. 
that therefore the issue isn't what you want. Again, it comes back to the issue is what does the community you live in, the society you live in want? That is a more important question. The reason why people get trapped in this problem is they find it very difficult to change what they want. But again, at the heart of mental health is the ability to change what you want and the ability to begin to like delivering the thing that society wants from you, and then society will give you back more of what you want. So again, I do a lot of marital therapy, a lot of couple counseling. I'm going to get into run into trouble a little bit here. I'm skating over a lot of territory very quickly. Um, a lot of women in particular come to me. They've been in some disastrous relationship. It's broken down. They've had a nightmare time. Back in the beginning of the relationship when they started dating, the guy was like some really attractive alpha male, right? He was, you know, the CEO of a bank and drove a Ferrari and lived this swashbuckling lifestyle. And they were attracted, these women, to that. It seemed to be what they wanted. And then they discovered, surely, uh, but sort of certainly after the period of time, the man was not honest, not reliable, not loyal, not useful to have in an emotional crisis if you were going through one. They deserted you. Now, many of these women will tell me they had male friends who were available to them, and these male friends were honest, reliable, loyal, dependable, blah, blah, blah. And then these women do the classic thing and say to me, but I wasn't attracted to them. They didn't turn me on. In other words, they're kind of saying, I can see these are valuable qualities and useful in a lifelong relationship, but it's not what I primarily wanted, okay? Guess what? I think you should change what you want from the Ferrari swashbuckling lifestyle to the honesty, dependability, reliability, loyalty thing. And if you changed it to that and wanted that, you might end up being a lot happier. So the notion of shifting uh, what you want becomes extremely important. Again, in an affluent society, we, we fall for this contract because we believe we have choices. That's what affluence gives us. Money means you have the choice because you don't have to worry about basic survival on a day-to-day -day basis. If you go to poor societies, no one's asking very poor people, what do you want? The poor person knows they've got to focus on basic survival. If the only job available to them in a poor society is cleaning the streets, they will clean the streets. They won't be bothered about thinking too hard about what they want. They will clean the streets to earn a living, to survive. The question never occurs to them about what do I want. This emerges when you get to an affluent society, and I believe embedded in that is a central problem. Okay, so we're running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to um, quicken this up so that we get to some more Q&A. I want to see the next slide, please. So um, this is uh, Rafa Nadal, a tennis player. I'm playing in the beach tennis world championships. I play a lot of what I call normal tennis or lawn tennis to differentiate it as well. I'm going to tell you a little anecdote about tennis now, which I'm hoping um, further develops my point about what do you want is a central problem. I play a lot of tennis and um, I can't help but observe, and I'm now going to annoy a lot of people I play tennis with now, um, that a lot of people who play tennis with me, obviously none of us are going on the tour anytime soon, but some are trying very hard to play well. I include myself in that. I have three different coaches every week. So you can see I take tennis very seriously. I have three different coaches. Um, and my wife actually is alarmed at the frequency which we sees me leaving the house in tennis gear. And I think she thinks I've actually retired and omitted to tell her. Um, but I take tennis very seriously. Um, but most people I play with play at a good level of tennis, but they don't take it quite as seriously as I do. I'm a bit unique on that front. So as a result, I arrive on the tennis court having done a hell of a lot more coaching than anyone else I play with. And I'm not meaning to sound arrogant, but the inevitable happens. I don't make as many errors as they do. And they will comment on this. They'll say, Raj, you hardly make any errors on the tennis court. And I feel I have to hold myself back from saying, they, they go, you don't make any errors. Why errors? What you don't make any errors? Why is that? I have to hold myself back from saying I don't see the point of errors. You know, um, so 
um, I observe these other players and they don't get any coaching at all. And uh, they hit the ball in the net, they hit the ball out, they hit the ball in the net, they hit the ball out. I'm playing with them. I notice they get grumpy and frustrated at their inability to control the ball. And then they go for a drink, a cup of tea afterwards, after two hours of mounting frustration and irritation with the way they play the game. I played um, at one of the tennis clubs last week uh, with a fellow partner who was actually quite good. Um, and we won six love, six love. OK, that was not a fun experience for our opponents. I can assure you of that, in my opinion, they looked very grumpy and utterly frustrated at the end of the experience. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand this. I'm a naive psychiatrist, perhaps. What is it these people want? You would have thought if they turn up day in, day out to play tennis with me, that my understanding of what they would want is to play the game well or better than the way they play at the moment, and to get fun from playing it well. What's the fun in turning up and playing disastrously for two hours and doing that week after week after week? I can't understand what it is that people want when they turn up and play tennis. And I think it's a deep question. What's going on here? Now, my approach of getting all the coaching means I do play well, but I do find the experience frustrating often playing with someone, my partner in doubles is rotated around. I, I never get to choose in club games. And as a result, I get grumpy with my partner who isn't often playing as well as me. And there's a cloud of simmering resentment over my head. And I know I have to control that and try and cheer up. So my approach does bring its own problems as well. The reason I'm going on about this is a famous saying in psychology, which is how you do anything reveals how you do everything. Let me repeat that because it's really important. How you do anything reveals how you do everything. If you're a psychiatrist listening to me talking, you can see straight away that I'm telling you something about myself and my approach to life by the fact I have three different coaches, three different coaching sessions every week. I take it very seriously. And taking it seriously means I enjoy the game. My, what I want is to play the game well, and that's where I get fun from. What are these other people doing? I don't understand in what they want. If they want to play tennis and therefore want to have fun, where's the fun in losing all the time? If you randomly, you might win occasionally if you meet someone who's even more crap than you. But basically, this is the way they lead their lives. And yet I'm playing at expensive tennis clubs where, where I'm dealing with successful people who clearly should have kind of worked out how to make life work. And I believe they're revealing something about the way they play tennis, about the way they lead their lives. Rafa Nadal is one of the greatest tennis players of all time. There's Novak Djokovic, Federer, we've had a golden age in tennis. Rafa Nadal plays really, really well. Uh, Rafa Nadal has coaching every single day. I mean, I can't understand why people can't watch Rafa Nadal play tennis and ask themselves, the guy doesn't need coaching, does he? Uh, not only does he have coaching every day, so what is the ignominy in seeking coaching when you're nowhere near as good as Rafa Nadal? Rafa Nadal, Djokovic, all the top 100 players, anyone who wants to be good at the game, and these people really are very good, and they still have coaching. They still Sorry have to, Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Prasad. We've yeah. only got about 10 minutes left, so we really need to get on to questions yeah. in a minute. Okay, well, let's go to Q&A. So basically, if these people have coaching, then basically they've understood that they need to do the work to get what they want. And that's the gap. People aren't willing to do the work to get what they want. And that is why they're not getting what they want. There's a gap between the work necessary to deliver what you want. People want stuff, they're not willing to do the work. And that is one of the roots of human unhappiness. So we'll close there because we're running out of time. Thank you very much. Okay, so Emma um, has said thank you for an interesting webinar. And she's asked what the best way is for tackling imposter syndrome. She said she finds it inhibits her ability to work and study effectively. So imposter syndrome is a famous psychological syndrome where people feel um, that they're not good enough. Um, they're very anxious. It's an anxiety disorder. They turn up and they um, feel not good enough, even though often and classically, again, at the risk of sounding sexist, this is meant to be a more female predicament than a male predicament in that women are theoretically um, meant to suffer a little bit less from the kind of um, over, overly arrogant confidence that men 
have in the workplace. Um, and so um, women who have been promoted often feel imposter syndrome. This is what the magazine articles will tell you, um, because they feel they're not good enough to be where they are. So believe in something is the heart behind this question. What do I believe in? I turn up on a tennis court and I believe I'm going to play well because I've had all the coaching. So believe in something. If you're going to believe in yourself, you can't just go with a kind of trite, it'll all be all right on the day. Get the training, get the coaching, do the work that delivers being good at your job and then believe in that. So imposter syndrome is cured by thinking, how do I know I'm good at my job? And if I'm not getting the feedback, how do I do the necessary training? I can do even over training to get good at something. What is it to be good? What's the essence of being good? I don't feel I'm good at it. Okay, but the question is, how do we determine whether one's good or not? So I would say the, the central question shifts to what can we believe in to derive self-confidence? What do I believe in? Believe in the work you've done to get good at something, believe in that and derive confidence. When I turn up on a tennis court, I know I've done more coaching than anyone else on that coach. And I derive a huge amount of confidence from that fact. Yeah, I think preparation helps a lot with confidence, doesn't it? Um, and a very interesting question here from um, Clive. He said, what can you do if you give a lot and get little or nothing back? So you're um, being taken for granted, perhaps. Yes, and this is a common problem. Um, so there's the opposite problem. You could call it doormat syndrome, where you're in a relationship, you're, you're delivering a lot and getting very little back in exchange. So. This is a question about investment. I'm going to use a business analogy here. Don't invest in an asset or a stock or something you want to invest in where you want to get a return and it keeps going south. Don't invest in something where you're not getting a return. So do not invest in people where you notice a lack of reciprocity. Then there's something else going wrong here. Invest a bit in people, then notice whether you get something back or not. If you get nothing back and you keep investing, you're now being exploited. And that is the opposite problem of what I was describing before. So it's very important to avoid being exploited. And that means look for people who are willing to be reciprocal and understand and are grateful for what you've given. So that's quite an important point. As a consultant psychiatrist, for example, I think I do my best for my patients. And some of them are very grateful for that. Some of them are a bit indifferent to the effort that I make. <laughs> um, but it's important to become aware of, of who to invest in, uh, uh, in terms of who's going to give something back. If you are investing and investing in people and they're not giving anything back, time to move on and find better people to invest in. Uh, a tricky question for you now from Dan. If you were health secretary in the UK, what's one thing you would do to reform the NHS? Oh, very good question. I'm going to say something very controversial now, which is that the problem with the NHS in the UK, no health system is perfect. Every health system around the world has got its problems. The issue is what problems, you know, are you going to trade for other problems? The health service in, in Britain is unique in the state provides health care. The state pays for health care. OK, the salaries of doctors, by and large, it's almost a monopoly supplier of health care in the UK. The state pays the doctors and the state provides it. The state pays for it, and the doctors who are treating you are employees of the state. Let me repeat the point. The state pays for it, and the state provides it. Why does it have to do both? Why can the state not pay for it, but not provide it? What that would mean is you gave out health care vouchers or ring fence the health care budget to each individual, but the state would give you money that you could only spend on health care. I would describe that as a personal health budget. Now what happens is that each individual takes a lot more responsibility for their health care and, in my opinion, makes better decisions. Hayek, a famous economist and philosopher, made the important point, which is the best people to make the decision are the people who have all the information. You as an individual have all the information or better information about your particular position in health than anyone else. And it's better that you make decisions about your health budget than some anonymous bureaucrat. People always say to me when I say, if we give everyone their own health budget, there'll be disasters because people will run out of money. I have not changed the size of the pie. I've just divided it up differently. 
The state runs out of money all the time now. People are dropping dead now from cancer that could be treated because the state has run out of money. You will run out of money. Everyone does. But you've got a better chance if you have your own health budget, of not running out because you will look after it better. If you divide the total um, NHS health budget, give or take, back of envelope calculation by every citizen in the UK, you get to something like £3,500, £3,500 a year. Multiply that by 60. I'm 60 years old. That's a lot of money. Um, and if that was invested in some kind of health bank, for example, if you saved your money, you could pool your money. The street could pool. The family could pool. Or you could go and buy health insurance with that budget. The state pays health care and provides health care in the UK. That doesn't work. And Hayek could have told you that's never going to work. It's state-controlled Soviet-style system. Liberate people, give them the money, let them decide what they do with it, and liberate them. And through liberation, you will get a much better health care system. Thank you. And uh, Nishiel says, thanks for a great talk. And um, can you talk more about the notion of the con of choice in an affluent society? Is the idea, regardless of comfort and wealth, you still have to do the work? And secondly, doing the work, the meta driving factor that can be helpful is work for the sake of the self mastery or growth mindset. And so how would you recommend one maintains a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset? Yeah, the growth mindset is really interesting. The reason, I mean, again, I play tennis or do anything, in my opinion, I know I'm going to sound a bit arrogant here, but I'm just trying to be clear with you, is I see it as a developmental process. I'm not just turning up to knock the ball over the net. I want to get better and better and better. And that is what the growth mindset is. I'm interested in getting better as a psychiatrist, not staying the same. I'm interested in being a better psychiatrist next week than I was this week. So the competitive element in me, I'm not, there's no accident here at the World Championships in beach tennis, that competitiveness takes me on a journey into getting better at stuff because I'm competitive. And if you're on a journey, that's a much better way to lead a life, in my opinion, though it's a tougher life, than that, no doubt about that. Being on a journey, if you're competitive, takes you into trying to be better, and that takes you into trying to understand tennis, for example, at a deeper level, and perform better, understand how to control the ball. It's a developmental journey. Most people are turning up to play because fun, for them, knocking the ball over the net. They're not on a journey of any development whatsoever. And ultimately, I think that ends in disaster and frustration. So um, competitiveness and, and wanting to deliver a better thing to the world takes you on a journey. Being on a journey, a lifelong journey of learning and self-development, I think is a better journey to be on, though it's a stressful journey. It has its own stresses. So um, uh, you have to be thinking about what journey do you want to be on what do you want to get better and better at? Everything you can get better at. You can get better at having conversations. You can get better at thinking. And I'm always amazed at how people reject the idea that you can learn to be better at practically everything you do and to go and seek expertise from people who specialize in that area, properly specialize, not YouTube gurus who have millions of followers but have no credentials on the subject. So find an expert and listen to them. I have always in my life thought the secret to life was find a great teacher at anything and stick to them like glue. My three coaches at tennis are brilliant coaches. They are brutal in their feedback, but I hang out with them and I stick with them like glue and they're taking me on that journey. Find a teacher. Teaching is the most important profession of all. And you can be taught to do anything well. Conversations. I had a running coach recently. My wife was very suspicious about that. Um, how can you have a running coach? She said, running is obvious. You put one foot in front of the next. But this was an Olympic level athlete. It was a gift from another client, a client of mine. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to afford it myself. And it was just amazing to learn. There's a lot to running, by the way, in terms of technique how you place your foot on the ground, the way you move your arms. Um, I have perfect technique now, by the way. I mean, fat people and stilettos race past me because I run very slowly and I shout after them, you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong. Anyway, um, find an expert, find a teacher and learn. You can learn at anything. Thank you. That's a great attitude to have. I think we've got time for one last question uh, from Robin. Uh, you mentioned what people want. At present, there is a great sense of entitlement to everything, particularly amongst younger people. How much does this contribute to a general sense of unhappiness? Yes, that's an excellent question. I think that people are entitled to several things. So it's the sense of entitlement, I think, is a deep problem. They're entitled to believe 
that they can be thinking about what they want, that they're privileged enough that what they want is important. It's not that important what you want. What's much more important is what service you can provide to the world, what the world wants. And in return for you delivering something that the world wants, you will get something back. I'm sorry to be brutal there. No one's interested in you and solving your problems. The world has problems. If you help the world solve its problems, then the world will be interested in helping you with your problem. But it's that way round, okay? You can see lots of needs around you, lots of unmet wants, unmet needs. I did a YouTube video on the psychology of seduction, which is available for free, and people can see a bit about that. The psychology of the unmet need is what I'm referring to here, how to identify the unmet need. So people shouldn't be, the entitlement of what do I want should be replaced with what do I observe the world needs. There's lots of different things the world needs. You could be moral about it in terms of its moral needs, or you could just be commercial about it in terms of what they're willing to pay me lots of money for. And that is a better way to navigate the world because you've got to be, you've got to be integrated that way into the economy. And that is a way of delivering happiness. Eventually, if you deliver something that people want and you you have a living that way, that's a great way of becoming happy. You are happy because you are functional and you are integrated. That's the secret to happiness. Thank you. Um, and also sticking up for the young people, but I think there's a general sense of unhappiness as in lots of wants that people feel that with legitimate wants are like, say, buying a house, paying off a student loan. I think a lot of young people feel that that's completely unattainable for them. And also, you know, the world we live in with the climate change, a lot of young people feel even the basic wants that older generations achieved easily, they won't be able to achieve at all, perhaps. So. Um, just make that point as well. But thank you very much for sharing your um, expertise and knowledge with us today. Um, Dr. Prasad, it was very enjoyable. And I hope, I'm sure everyone gained a bit of knowledge that they'll take away to improve their lives. Um, and also do, do keep an eye on the forthcoming lectures. We've got three, um, two more for you next week. Um, one on the Tower of London, keeping it relevant, and also on the role of the um, Common Sergeant and Recorder of the City of London. So thanks very much for uh, logging in and contributing to the discussion today, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.